The crowds asked him, what then should we do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm going to read from the first couple of lines of each of our scriptures for today. From Zephaniah, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. From Isaiah, you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. From Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And from Luke, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Those of you who are about my age or maybe have children about my age might remember the Sesame Street jingle. One of these things is not like the others. This Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, is also called Gaudate Sunday, for the Latin word for rejoice. This is the Sunday of joy. That's why we get the pink candle today. It's a joyful pink break from dark blue or dark purple. It's a little burst of fun. We get joy, rejoicing, in our Old Testament reading, the canticle, and our epistle. And it feels a little like whoever chose the gospel reading for today didn't get the memo. Being called a snake right off the bat doesn't make me feel particularly joyful. Where's the joy? Where's the rejoicing in this reading from Luke? We need to go to the shore of the Jordan River. We have a great advantage of being a church, if not directly on the river, just almost. Every one of you ought to be able to imagine standing on the water's edge, not that far from here. Especially useful for our imagination, the Jordan River is much more like the Blanco River than it is like the Mississippi. We don't have to work that hard to picture John standing in or near the water and the crowd all around. We know from the reading that the crowd is diverse. L Luke mentions tax collectors and soldiers. John had traveled all the region around the Jordan and people came to him to be baptized. We can imagine men and women and children, people who journeyed from the same village together and others who are strangers. A crowd of people with different professions from different walks of life and who have different hopes and expectations of what John has to offer them. They made an effort, traveled to where John would be, and when they got there and he started talking, he called them snakes. I think maybe the most hopeful part of this story is that after John calls them snakes, then goes on to threaten them about trees that don't bear fruit, getting thrown into the fire, that people don't just get mad and leave. They don't hurl insults back at John or argue with what he's said. They don't try to discredit him. They simply accept what he says and then offer a generous response. What then should we do? There is such spiritual maturity in this question. The people gathered around John the Baptist knew themselves. They were honest with themselves. They knew they could do better. And rather than beating themselves up about it, they simply want to start doing better. And what about John the Baptist, who'd just been calling them names? John knows them too. He looks into the crowd and sees not a single unit, but individuals. John doesn't preach in general terms, be kind, be fair. He gives specific examples about coats and food specific instructions for tax collectors and soldiers. On the surface, it seems like these things that John is suggesting aren't even that hard. He doesn't tell the tax collectors and soldiers that they need to quit their jobs. He just tells them that they need to do their jobs without taking advantage of anyone else. He isn't asking anyone to give away their last coat or their last scrap of food in the house. Just share your extra. That doesn't seem so hard. We're good at sharing our extra, particularly at Christmas time. We have lots of good opportunities to do it. You could donate money toward Christmas gifts for families in the Blanco area, identified by the Good Samaritan Center. 
You could donate a blanket to the Community Resource Center. Neither of these things are hard at all. But we need to look deeper. There was a lot more to what John was asking people than it might seem. John was actually asking these people to change their system. It wasn't about donating one coat one time. This was about changing a pattern of behavior. And changing our behavior patterns, changing our habits, is hard. That's why it matters to be a community. It's hard to be the one tax collector trying to be intentional about not taking more than you should when all the other tax collectors think you're being ridiculous and foolish. But if you know one or two other tax collectors who are trying to do what you're doing, it feels a lot easier. We might all as individuals want to help a family have a nice Christmas, but we can do so much more when we pool our resources as a church. I might have an extra coat, but not know who to give it to. If I'm part of a community, I have a place to start, people to ask. Likely, someone else has an extra coat too, and my asking might remind them of that unused coat in the back of their closet. I keep asking, and someone knows, someone who knows exactly what to do with my extra coat, and by now, this community has 10 coats to give away. Are you starting to see the joy? Picture that group of people standing by the river listening to John talk. They're inspired by what John has to say, and they're inspired by each other. They receive the good news and enter the water for baptism. This isn't a somber crowd. It's a joyful and exuberant one. There is joy inspired by a real hope for something better. That's the same kind of joy expressed by the prophet Zephaniah, the prophet Isaiah, and by Paul writing to the Philippians. Neither Zephaniah, nor Isaiah, nor Paul was experiencing happy, celebratory conditions when their books were composed. Zephaniah and Isaiah were both written in a time between the fall of the Northern Kingdom and the fall of the Southern Kingdom. This was not a time of great prosperity. People were anxious and afraid. And the letter to the Philippians? That was written while Paul was in prison. Zephaniah, Isaiah, and Paul were actually facing pretty dire circumstances. How could they tell other people to rejoice? They had complete and total trust that God was in control of the situation. And that with God, not only is anything possible, but God will make it good. Rejoice, says Zephaniah, because the Lord is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. Rejoice, says Isaiah, because God saves. The Lord is our stronghold and defense. Rejoice, says Paul to the Philippians, because the Lord is near. In our gospel passage from Luke, John doesn't tell people to rejoice. Instead, he gives them something to rejoice about. Someone is coming. Someone is near. Someone to be in their midst, to be their stronghold and defense. Someone so powerful, so amazing, that John thinks he won't even be able to help him take his shoes off. A menial task for a servant. And when this person comes, he won't offer a baptism with water like the baptism John can offer. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Yes, this is good news. Joy-inspiring news. What then should we do? I pray that the community that is St. Michael's will challenge you and encourage you to be generous and just. I hope this community inspires you to be joyful. May you find and experience joy this Gaudate Sunday and as we continue through this Advent season. We rejoice in celebration that Christ came in human form 2,000 years ago. We rejoice in anticipation of Christ's coming in glory. And we rejoice in the sure and certain knowledge that Christ is with us now. Thanks be to God.